Hello everyone and welcome to Lawrence Plays Factorio Space Exploration and Crastorio 2. We've been down to three people for the last uh, couple of weeks because uh, Mark has been off on uh, doing his gallivanting, but we've still managed to make some progress and, uh, um, and take some steps forward towards looking into the deep space sciences and other uh, terrifying things like that. So join me as I run through our progress from the last stream. My first achievement last time was getting the uh, nanomaterial production up and running. So you'll remember from last week, I got the I got all the inputs coming in. So we have the um, the, the quantum processors, the light green bottles, uh, pink clouds, and all of these solids coming in. But that was as far as I got. So in the last stream, I started building up over here where we we're now making the what are these dynamic emitters, I think they're called. Which is funny, I, th I thought we were already making these somewhere, but I had a good look around and I couldn't find them. And I think I was actually thinking of these things, which are what which are actually called um, energy control units. Uh, which are obviously, obviously nothing like dynamic emitters, but they're a weird thing that I hadn't heard of, and so um, I think that's probably what I was thinking of when I thought we'd already got them. And so these were actually quite straightforward. It was just a case of feeding in uh, four, four different four different things plus some pink clouds into an electromagnetic facility, and then it would spit out these uh, these dynamic emitters, which we could then take away on a belt. Um, and because I brought all of the resources up last week, it was it was very very easy. I just slapped down some uh, space scaffolding, put the machines in, ran the belts along, no, uh, and the pipes along, and no problem there. That that was that was that was a nice easy part. The, a nice gentle introduction to the, to the stream. Uh, I then carried on with the uh, nanomaterial production and that was, to be honest, that was quite easy as well. I needed the dynamic emitters that I'd just started making um, and then all, and a load of the other things that we had in this area. But to be honest, fitting all these together was, was again, very, very straightforward. I did realise afterwards that because I've put these machines actually up and touching each other, that means I've formed links between the uh, super chilled thermofluid and the warm thermofluid and the warm thermofluid and the pink clouds. Now, these don't don't really matter because they're not actually joined together. There will be no mixing of the fluids. We're not going to get. We're not going to end up with a load of thermofluid going up and down this pipe over here. However, it does confuse the game a little bit. And if we look, at, as you can see, if I look at this pipe here, it, we can see the contents of all of the different fluid systems in, from this one pipe, uh, which isn't quite what we want to see. Really, that's not how it should look. And this could potentially cause problems if I come in and try and rebuild anything by hand because you can't because I wouldn't be able to modify any of these pipes because the game was a hey you're trying to mix fluids and it wouldn't let. Me. However, if you try and do it with bots, then the game doesn't care. So I can put in I can put in some extra pieces of pipe like this, and link, uh, 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 and it'll be absolutely fine. The the game won't mind. So yes, if you're building with bots, then the game doesn't mind about a little bit of fluid mixing. And because the fluids aren't actually mixed, it's just that the networks are sort of touching. Then it's okay. What I perhaps should have done is spaced them out slightly more and had this one one extra square to cross to the left. But then I wouldn't have had enough room to fit four of these in between the uh, two two um, beacons. Although so that said, I could then have, I could, I could have shifted these out. Yeah, it would have been a little bit awkward. Because as you can see over here, we've got one, two. Only, yeah, there's only two two free squares there between those, so we'd only be able to have a gap between this one and this one. Now, I could also have done something clever with rotating of machines. So, for example, I could have had this one that way around, in which case. You can see down here that it's only uh, warm thermofluids touching across there, and we're still feeding in the pink clouds okay, and if I brought the um, the, cold, the super chilled thermofluid in on this side, then that would have been absolutely fine, but because it was going into the middle, that, that didn't work. Um, and also, you can only do that so many times. So for example, I could do it here again exactly the same way, but then over here on this side, it's a little bit more complicated because things are, because there's, because there's so many different fluids being pushed into these machines. So, basically, short answer, I don't care. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna do it the easy way. And, 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 not, and not worry about it. <laughs> Getting the fluids in was reasonably straightforward. Across the top, it's easy because you can just run it in along the um, along the, the sort of the main line here, next to, right next to the machines, and use underground pipes so that there's room for the inserters. On the other side, I'm just feeding it out and then having another pipe underneath to, uh, with with the undergrounds linking across the belts like that. Not all nice and straightforward. Um, I did then run into a, an issue when I tried to put in the the, uh, the the machines on the opposite side down here because then these you can't reorder the uh, the fluid inputs along here. So I couldn't put I couldn't put, for example, the uh, the pink cloud input here and the thermofluid input here we've got the thermofluid input here but you know what, you know what I mean um, I couldn't I can't I, you can't swap them around so I end up having to put in a T, a T piece here across in the middle and then another T piece over here but you know it all works so I'm not going to complain too much about it I was quite surprised when I discovered how quickly these seems these seem to be produced um, I was expecting to have to go along here with lots of speed modules and increased throughputs and supplies and all that sort of stuff in order just in order to de desperately trying to get a supply of well anything through but I glanced away for a few minutes to look at something else, came back, and, and this and this warehouse was completely full of nanomaterials. Now, granted, they only stack up to 50, which isn't huge, but it's also not insignificant. Uh, we, we, we made uh, 25,000 nanomaterials very, very quickly, so I stuck in a train here and 
and got them being taken away. I, I, I was surprised at how easy it was. And that is why I've got these beacons in because I was trying to plan ahead, but the beacons and the machines don't have any modules in them. So I guess maybe in the future when we realise we've suddenly used up all of the uh, nanomaterials and we're actually getting through them a lot faster than we thought we were going to, then maybe I'll come back and put in the speed modules. So I've left the infrastructure available for doing that, but at the moment it's not really necessary. And the interesting thing about this setup is I can put speed modules in two different places. I can either put them in the machines themselves, or I can put them in the beacons. And, and a module that goes in a machine will have will obviously affect that machine, because it's in the machine. But a module in a beacon will affect all of the machines underneath it, but only at 50% of that module's effectiveness. So in this particular case here, I'm actually better off putting the modules into the beacons first, because I won't need as many, because this beacon is affecting... 14 different machines around it, which means any any module I put in there will have seven times the effect, because of the half effectivity, of putting the modules into, into the actual machine. So if I come along and put tier 6 modules into this machine here, that's probably better than coming along and putting tier 4 or tier 5 modules into all of the, into all of the machines. Although I have to admit I didn't really think of that until just now. Part the main reason I put these beacons in here was because, as I said, I was expecting to need to put speed modules into absolutely everything and just get everything blazing along at absolute maximum speed. But I guess the um, the recipe for nanomaterials, it, which is a 60 second crafting time, but then it's in a machine that runs at a speed of 10 anyway. So it's a 6 second crafting time and, and there's quite a lot of them because I got a little bit carried away. My theory was I've got all these belts coming down here. So each one of these is coming out at, at the rate of, well, one belt. And then down here, they're being fed in at half a belt per row. I can put in more machines, more machines, more machines until we're using up everything that's on this belt. But we're never going to be able to bring in more than half a belt's worth because I've got because it's only feeding onto the half belt there. So if I do that twice, then two half belts equals one belt, and I'm using all of the input from up here. Um, please don't check my maths on whether two times half equals equals one. So this is yes, this is working quite nicely. It has occurred to me that I'm probably going to need to do some shenanigans around here in order to get the um, the nanomaterials being fed down the bus further because we do intend to make deep space science down here once we get to it and I think that's probably going to require nanomaterials in fairly large quantities. I, it did occur to me that I could just pull them out back out of this warehouse here but I think that's probably it's a, it's a messy way of doing things it's going to be slightly bad for our UPS. Better off just to stick in a splitter probably here and a, and then do some shenaniganing around here somewhere. Yeah if I put together something like that then it's going to get a little bit in the way of whatever's trying to come down this, this column of the bus but um, Otherwise, that's going to be a nice way of merging the two together. I did do a bit of, I did cause a bit of sort of a mess of spaghetti here. The, ideally, these dynamic emitters perhaps should have been a little bit of further over to the left, coming down over here, and all of this should have been a bit further over to leave a bit more space. Because now there's only uh, there's one, two spaces left on this on this bus. Or there's a third one down here from the quantum where the quantum processors are going. But I might want to split, bring them down as well. You never know. Um, there's three spaces on. Four spaces on this bus, or three if I count the um, the nanomaterials down here. Uh, so there's a little bit of space on this bus as well. But basically, if I want to, if I want to bring more stuff in on this train, there's not going to be a lot of room for putting in extra warehouses to bring it out. So I'm probably going to need to put in an extra drop-off train over here for uh, for do, for dealing for bringing any other more advanced stuff out that as as and when we need it. So eh, it's I, I could have designed this better, but never mind. One of the tweaks I did make was one I think I was talking about last week saying I should really do, and I have now done it, is I put in I put in a monitoring system over here that's watching the contents of this warehouse, and if that ever gets down to zero, then the subtracting one from everything that's supposed to be in there will be passed over to this um, combinator, and that will see that something is less than zero, so it will output one arrow launch signal. That then gets fed into this one, along with the signals from here. That's all then passed onto the, um, on, onto the network over here, and so as you can see, we're now... We've got we've got some negative numbers on there because we're subtracting over here because of the things that we're requesting. However, if we look on the other side, if we look on the input of this one, they're all positive. So we've got some things being we've got some requests being sent down and being loaded into the train down here on Norvis, but we haven't got the arrow signal being sent down because we haven't got down we haven't got to actually zero of any of those things in store yet. So this train will keep filling up until it's until either it's completely full, in which case it'll depart immediately, or until the belts feeding it are completely full, which means we've put in as much stuff as we can and now the belts have jammed up because there's some half empty uh, empty slots like the, these two up here. Or it'll wait until it sees an up arrow and some inactivity, and when it gets when it gets that, then it knows it's time for it to leave. So it will it will then set off automatically. 
I've done exactly the same thing with the train that brings up all the resources to the thermofluid area and just generally that sort of recycling area, which is this train over here. So you can see same sort of system set up over here with the, with these with these requests and it's watching for the train to be full or the train to or, or something to be empty up top. And the reason I did that was because in the last uh, at the end of the last video we'd we'd run out of um, sulfur completely, but because we hadn't managed to fill the train up with other stuff because the amount of rough data substrates we were requesting has gone down a lot and the number we're getting through has gone down a lot because we've actually got enough memory cards for once. Uh, because of all of that, we stopped filling the train up quite as quickly, and so I've put in another a system here to automatically trigger when the, when it when it runs out of anything and then send the train up. And I've also increased some of the numbers a little bit, so we now have a decent amount of sulfur here that can pour down here, be made into the thermofluid. We've now got lots of thermofluid. This system is basically full, which is lovely. And that means we've been able to bring some over to here, to where we're making the nanomaterials. And so now over here we have all of the thermofluid we could possibly drink at all the different temperatures we could possibly want. And so, that meant I have now have a supply of nanomaterials available. As I said, I've now brought those over onto the bus, and they're being, as you can see over here on the left-hand side, they are now being brought up the uh, the column of construction. So there's lots, lots of them coming up here. And I've stuck them on the same belt that had the lattice pressure vessels that Mark made a couple of weeks ago as well. So those are all coming up here into the into, into the, into the uh, construction set area up here, along with a few other things that I had to um, finagle into the system. And now that's allowing us to make, start making these high-temperature heat exchangers and the high-temperature turbines. These weren't too bad once I had the nanomaterials together. So the nanomaterials, as you, you saw me making those, I've got them onto the bus now, by bring, being brought over by train, that's fine, we've got a supply of them available. The heavy composites weren't already up here, but it was relatively easy to squeeze them into the bus system that, in, that's bringing things up by train from, from Norvis up to Norbit and then putting them onto the space bus, so pull them off there, that was easy enough. Mark made these and these two were already on the, already on the belt. We also needed superconductor cable, but somebody's already making those on the column of construction. Those are being brought up. Tristan already started bringing up heavy assemblies. And so, yeah, make, put the, once I'd done that, putting all these together was actually really quite straightforward. And now, having the heat exchangers and the turbines means I've now been able to land Mark's uh, prototype interstellar transport ship. That's this one here. So this one's now landed. It's being heated up by a, uh, a beam emitter, and it is now at full temperature. So with the beam emitter, it doesn't technically need to still be shining on the ship, but, you know, it's there. We might as well let it run. So the ship is now nice and toasty. Uh, we've got all, all, the, all the heat in the heat exchanger. We've fed a bit of water in. And as you can see, the, uh, the turbine here is gently ticking over. It's producing, I guess it's producing the electricity to keep the ship happy and keep the ship running and idling while it's at here because the, um, the lasers will have a very small uh, power drawer. The engines probably have a very small power drawer even when they're not doing something, so does the computer. It's just sitting there. It's not doing very much, but it's, uh, yeah, it's ticking through tiny amounts of electricity, as you can see. We're getting, oh, we're getting through 1.2 megawatts, most of that going into, into the laser turrets, as I, as, I, as I said. So And so that's fine. These systems work by, um, by take, taking the extremely hot temperatures that come out of these uh, energy beam receivers, and these high-temperature heat exchangers are capable of dealing with that much heat. So these will produce steam at about a bajillion degrees. C, presumably the same 10,000 as these are. Let's, let's have a look. If we look in here, the input is oh no, so only, only at 5,000, and that means this can carry on working until it gets all the way down to 5,000. So we're getting steam out at 5,000 degrees, goes into the high temperature turbine generator, which produces huge amounts of power. Uh, and then, and then, but then, awkwardly, it produces both water, which you can then feed back round to um, to steam back into steam. Uh, I think the word is boil, actually. Uh, which you can boil back into steam, but it also it also releases a bit of steam at 415 degrees, which you then have to pump out into these sort of n normal condenser turbines to get the last bit of power out of it, and to then condense the steam back down into water, which can be then fed round around the system. It's a mostly closed loop system. You do lose a little bit of the uh, of the water, so you don't quite get 100% of the water out that you put in. But it's mostly, it's nearly closed loop, and that means that you can fill up a relatively small tank like this, and that will be sufficient to keep the system running for quite a long flight. We haven't actually taken this spaceship anywhere yet. Uh, I might go out and try and start mining some Naquim in the next uh, in the next stream, so that'll be fun. That'll require this ship and and uh, allow me to go out and start um, investigating absolutely terrifying things. And so as part of that, I had a bit of a tweak of Mark's cargo ship design. So previously, Mark has made us a set of cargo ships like this. You've seen these all a hundred times before. All of our ships are basically following this design, and there's a row of them all the way across here. We can have as many as, many as we need, basically, all going off to the different planets where we get all of our exotic materials from. These ships are great for flying around inside the solar system because they've got the solar panels. They can pick up the, the energy they need from the, uh, from the sun, convert it into electricity, fill up the accumulators, and then that can be used to power the ion engines. Because ion, ion engines are great. They're really powerful. You get loads of power out of them, and the fuel goes a really, really long way. 
but they do require a lot of electricity in order to run. Uh, as you can see down there, it's 10 megawatts per engine, which is quite a bit. And so you do need you need to feed them with quite a lot of power, which is why there's quite so many solar panels in the spaceship. And that is just about enough to keep them all going. It's not, I think it might not quite be enough to keep them all going if you're all the way out at Snowdrop. So the closer you are to the sun, the more energy you get from your solar panels, so, which is why we've got this massive solar array and the beam emitters in orbit around Kalidas. But the further out you go, you get less and less power. So if we have a look in, uh, in Kalidas orbit, you can see these solar panels are producing 12.1 megawatts. If we look all the way out at Snowdrop, well, we've not put any solar panels in because they'd be basically useless. Uh, okay, we'll have to have a look in the, in the numbers over here. So here, we only get 110% solar effectiveness, and that's on that's in orbit. Whereas in orbit around Kalidas, we get 1,500%. So solar panels are literally 15 times more effective in uh, Kalidas orbit than they are in, in, in Snowdrop orbit. Down on Snowdrop itself, you only get 22% solar because of the um, attenuation through the atmosphere. So they're really, really bad down on the ground. So yeah, this is, this is why we don't have solar here. And has been using a beam emitter and a load of heat exchangers down here to, to boil, again boil water and turn it into steam. Now this is this is old tech now because this was this was built before we had the high temperature heat exchangers. So these are these are only really capable of dealing with steam up at about I think up at maybe a thousand degrees something like that. They can't take full advantage of the energy beam receiver, but. We had them available at the time when this was being built, and so we're using the we're using the normal tier heat exchangers because there's no real reason. Uh, they, they, it doesn't cause any problems. They're just not quite as efficient as they would otherwise be. And you know, solar power that's coming in as a giant death ray from space is basically unlimited and free, so we don't care about it not being completely efficient. Anyway, that was a little bit of a tangent. Uh, the, the reason I was talking about that is because yes, you need a lot of power to run your ion engines, and so when you leave the solar system and fly out into the depths of interstellar space, your solar panels are basically useless. You can't do a thing with them. And so that, that's when you start to have, when you want some other sort of power. And these beam receivers, when they get, once they've been heated up all the way to 10,000 degrees, it takes a long time and a lot of pulling a lot of energy out of them to bring them back down to the 5,000 degrees where these things stop working properly. And so that means you can use them as a sort of a thermal battery. You charge it up when it's in orbit and then you fly off with it, go wherever you want, and you've got the power in there. You're taking the, the power with you as heat in order to, in order to keep the spaceship running while you're out there. So that allows us to produce loads and loads of electricity from these things. I think these are capable of producing about half a gigawatt each between them or something like that. And that's easily going to be enough to power these three engines on the back and, and then some. In fact, in my 0.5 run, I would fly one of these ships out to my deep space asteroid field uh, base area and then use the heat that was in the in the uh, energy beam receiver to, to boil water that was on that asteroid field and put turn it into steam at 5,000 degrees and then store that on the asteroid field in order to power it when the ship wasn't there. So essentially, the ship was using the heat battery built into it to go out there and recharge my outpost and then it would fly back again. There are other ways you can do it, but I thought but that way seemed really like a really, really nice way to do it to me. And so this is going to be the ship that will fly out to the to our, our asteroid field uh, uh, space stations and will transport the Naquium backwards and forwards. Exactly how we're going to do that, uh, we, shall, we shall see. There is lo lots of decisions to be made and I'm not really sure at this point because it's going to be difficult. But we'll find a way. We, we, we'll, we'll definitely find a way and it'll be, I'm sure it'll be very exciting. <laughs> so uh, yeah, tune in for that. So yes, I have been looking into Naquium processing, and it turns out one of the things you need to uh, to deal to process Naquium, one of the stages, requires methane gas. And so Mark has been generating a certain amount of gas over here on Big Red, uh, as part of the bio everything, the Vita Melange processing system. Um, it's made from I oh this this step here where when you when you bl when you bloom the uh, the Vita Melange, it uh, it releases some methane gas. However. He's also run out of cryonite because we're not shipping cryonite around by delivery cannon anymore. And that means he's got a load of methane gas that he can't freeze down into methane ice. And so it's just been sort of being blown off into the atmosphere. And that's not good because we're going to need, we're going to want that. I, sus I strongly suspect that this, this processing on, on Big Red is not going to produce enough uh, methane gas. However, if it can produce some, then that's going to be useful. And so Tristan has started the process of getting more cryonite to be brought over to here in order to feed it down here into this system and, and made into cryonite slush, which we can use to freeze the methane gas. It looks like none of, none of it has actually arrived here yet. But if we look at the spaceport in Norbit and at the big grid uh, ship area here, you can see that there is some cryonite in the warehouse.
warehouses here. Uh, there's about about 2,000 of it in these warehouses. So some of it is going to be taken out. So that's, that's a good start. So Tristan has got, come along. He's put in the uh, put in a feed of cryonite here. This is working in the normal way. We're watching to see whether this area needs some cryonite. If it doesn't need cryonite, then we don't pass it through. If it does need cryonite, we do. Um, and there's a standard supply coming in off the off the, off the belts here that's, that's being brought in from, from Snowdrop. So this is all working basically in the same way that every other one of these works. So the big grid ship will arrive here at some point. It will load up with all of these things that are to be taken out there. And then when it gets to big red orbit, it can then unload. It'll that'll all flow down here, be put into the train, unloaded over here into this warehouse, and then presumably, yes, here we go. There's a there's a cryonite belt coming out of the top of here, going underneath some of these, going, oh, going into warehouse to stockpile it over here. This is a weird design, but I mean it clearly works, so I'm not gonna knock it. Just I'm just gonna merely say it, it looks a bit weird. <laughs> and then once it eventually gets over here, it can then be fed down this belt over here and be used to make the uh, the methane ice as I was saying earlier so that sh that will work it's just in a position at the moment where we're, I was going to say we're waiting for the ship to leave but the ship has just left so it's on its way out now and once it gets to Norvis it'll it'll be able to pick up the cryonite unload the vitamelange and all the junks in it and uh, and then come bring the bring cryonite back out to big grid and everything will work fine I hope I expect I'm pretty sure pretty confident Tristan also mentioned that he's had to fiddle with the um the unloading systems for the trains up here in big grid orbit or big orbit whatever we're going to call it um, because we've got the, we've got these filter inserters unloading, and previously it was fine because we were unloading four different things, so they could be in the slots along here, and you whitelist them, and it just unloads those things, and it goes out and it gets shipped, shipped out into the spaceship. Great. Unfortunately, now we have more than four things that need to be taken down to the down to the planet, so we need to blacklist, uh, and we've got probably got uh, who knows how many things being brought up. So we need to, so essentially we need to blacklist five different things. So the way we're doing that is we're looking at what's on the train by getting reading train contents in the station, feeding that through to this combination which is then subtracting a million from each of the things that we don't want to unload here. So if there is any of that in the train, the number will be cancelled out by these huge negative numbers. And then feeding those numbers into the inserters along here and to set the filters. So when the train arrives with a load of miscellaneous rocks and ores and goodness knows what on it, those can all be unloaded nice and quickly by these inserters without us having to worry about uh, without us having to worry about unloading any of the things we want to leave in the train. So that's quite a neat system. I like that. We also can't do it the other way around by whitelisting the things we, the things we actually want to unload specifically because from down here these trains bring up a lot of different things. If we have a look in this train, uh, if I sort this cargo wagon, you can see we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 different things in this train already. And there's only one type of uh, vitamelange being fed in at the moment. When we're actually, If we're actually feeding them all in, then we'd have 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 different things potentially going into the train. And so we can't just use the four things to uh, say, yes, these are the specific things we want to unload. It just, just wouldn't work. Um, but the system as it is works very nicely, so it's a little bit more complicated, but it's quite neat and, and, and as I say, works very nicely. While I'm talking about Tristan's gases, if you'll pardon the expression, he also uh, did, did a little bit of work over here. This is, this is where we are uh, cracking the heavy oil, the excess heavy oil that comes from recycling if we don't need it to be made into thermofluid. We're passing it over here to be cracked down into petroleum gas. And apparently the petroleum gas wasn't very well balanced. We had um, uh, presumably too much of it being brought in. So now he's put in uh, this pipe coming over here, which is pumping through only when there's less than 10,000 petroleum gas in this tank. So that makes sure that this is always kept at a relatively low level, so it's always going to be room in theory for this to pump out any excess petroleum gas that's made by through cra through cracking that said i don't expect this to run very much because i expect most of the heavy oil that's being produced to be turned into thermofluid that said that said it's good to have the overflow in here as i was talking about last week because at some point we're probably going to get to we're probably going to end up with enough thermofluid in fact we've got enough thermofluid now uh, so we're not going to be so we could well end up in a, in a position where we have too much uh, too much heavy oil and that causes problems and so we're, we're cracking it down over here and i think there's enough other stuff we're making with the um with the petroleum gas like we're making the, the orange goo the chemical gel over here with it don't see anything else it's being used for but yeah at least it is being used for that so that's a, that is a another sink for it so uh, we will we'll, we'll keep an eye on it make sure it doesn't it doesn't overflow but that should be all right tristan also managed to solve the battery mystery that I was talking about last time where we had a ridiculous number of flat batteries in the in the filling up all these uh, chests around here and it was it was very strange we weren't quite sure what was going on it turns out that up here somewhere there was a belt in here that was pointing the wrong way perhaps something probably something like that and that meant that we weren't feeding any of the batteries through from the uh, from the battery supply into the into any part of the factory that was any further east than this point which is pretty much slap bang in the middle and so that meant all of these belts had grad been gradually emptying to keep the trains going all the way down here all these belts had emptied and that 
was where the thousands and thousands of extra batteries had, had come from. Because they'd come off these belts, they'd been fed into trains, the trains had run around, discharged the batteries, and then the flat batteries had been passed out onto the disposal belts, and sent, sent back to be recharged, and that had filled up the supply down here for where the where the charged batteries go, and then so and so the, the uh, discharged batteries were all backing up. Now that that has been sorted, as you can see, all these chests are empty. There's none on this belt across here. All these machines are idle. Yeah, the, the things things are basically sorted out. We now have a comfortable uh, 389 batteries in this chest, and that is, that is a good number to have. So. Yeah, well spotted there, Tristan. This seems to this has solved the mystery and sorted the problem out, and now everything is happy again. So we can put everything back to normal over here, and yeah, it's just it's it's, it's just working again nicely now that we found the problem. <laughs> Oh dear. Tristan has also done some upgrading of our science area. So we're now moved on to these these singularity labs. And these are tier four labs, which mean they're um, probably mean they're much faster and more expensive, just generally better than the earlier ones. So actually may no, may take make make actually they're tier five labs because you've got the burner labs first, which are basic labs that can run on by burning fuel, as the name implies. You get a nice little flame coming out of the top, and you can even see the chimney if you look really closely at the icon. Then you move on to the electric labs, which are basically the same, but they run off electricity, so they're basically the same. Then you get onto the advanced labs, and these are ones that are capable of doing some of the slightly more advanced space sciences. So I think they can do all of your, your Norvian sciences, your red, green, grey, blue, gold cards. That's the basic labs. Then the advanced ones can also do space science and and utility and production science. Sorry, utility and production science. Then you get onto the space science labs, which I believe are they're, they're, they're probably bigger and faster and stronger and so on. And they can do the um, the four tiers of sciences. So you can do the astro, the energy, material, biological, matter, advanced, double plus good, all those sort of things. All all those ones. And they're probably and they probably run faster and take more modules as well. Then you move on to the singularity labs, which are even better and will allow you to do deep space science. So, we've, so we're in fact gradually advancing. And so as you can see, if we look along here, um, this runs at a speed of one plus two and a half. Uh, this one's also one plus two and a half. This one's two and a half plus six and a half, a quarter, six and a quarter, so significantly faster. Then five plus 12, so again, even faster, faster. And these ones run at 10 plus 25, so really, really fast. So as you work through, they go, they get faster and faster. Roughly, it looks like they're roughly doubling each tier. And also, I strongly suspect they take more and more modules. So this one takes, this one will take eight modules, and that means we are now doing research with a productivity boost of 152 percent or 148 percent. So about one point, about 150 percent boost on the on the um, on the science productivity. And that means that for every science pack we use we get two and a half science packs worth of research done from it. So as you can imagine, that makes that makes doing science much, much cheaper and is why it's always very, very important to put the best modules you possibly can into your science labs, uh, which Tristan has already done. So yeah, well done there. He's also upgraded the modules in the uh, wide area beacon down here. So he's making these uh, science labs run significantly quicker. As you can see, they're running, they're running at speeds of 103, 106, uh, which is Astonishing! That's absolutely immense. But they're, they're, this is this is really good. We're getting we're getting huge amounts of science out of our labs, so I'm very happy with that. He also moved this um, this wide area beacon a little bit. I think he moved it down because maybe it was up above that above there before, and so it's now covering these machines down here that are making the significant data because he'd noticed that we were very very short of that. So he's put better sp speed modules into the computers down here to make them run faster, produce more significant data, um, and also as I say, put them in underneath this beacon as well. If we do need more speed in the future, then we can just extend this along here, make put more computers in. But for now, this is probably going to be a good, good, good enough, at least until we get to the tier three supercomputers. As part of this, Tristan seems to have made a, a chest of, it's, it's not quite a chest of shame, but it's a chest of a lot of science. Um, so this is presumably from pulling out the two labs that were in here before. He, he, there was an enormous quantity of uh, science packs produced or released because they, they, all, they all load up into the labs. You can see we've got 200 of each one in there. And so those have all been shoved into a warehouse up here where they can now pour down the belts and go back into here. And as we start doing sciences, it looks like we're going to need to do a lot of the early astro sciences in order to get them through. But he's managed to transfer at least some of them back through into the, into the labs down here. So they're not they're not all up here, just, just, just most of them. Making these labs was fairly complicated. If we have a look at the recipe for them, if we look at earlier early labs, these are, these are all fairly straightforward. You do things like sing, single cylinder engine, stone bricks, copper for sure. Basic, basic bits and pieces that you ha you tend to have lying around. Okay, they're get, getting a little bit more advanced here with uh, with red circuits. Sure, that's not that's not too bad. Um, then again, more advanced ingredients. But then making this one uh, requires 
loads of stuff. So first, it, first it requires the dynamic emitters and nanomaterials that I had only just made, and the heavy composition AI cores. I don't even know where we're making those. I think it's somewhere in bio biology. It requires hypercores. It requires thermal thermal radiator twos, which we aren't even make weren't even making at the time, and a load of uh, supercooled thermofluid as well. And so Tristan went off to somewhere in the middle of the base uh, where there was a suitable supply of thermofluid and put in a temporary machine there, and then pulled in some pulled in some resources by bots. Which, to be honest, I'm happy to forgive him for um, because this sort of thing, making this sort of thing is is what logistics bots are good for um and, and then tapping into a thermofluid uh, uh, feed somewhere is also, also called cow good so but that does mean he has also made the thermal radiator twos up here so i think this might be another machine making thermal radiator ones yes it is it's not feeding out into a red uh, red chest but then that's feeding into here to make thermal radiator twos and they're all going into a box here where they can go off to be used for whatever now they're expensive and awkward enough to make that we don't really want to go through and start replacing all of our radiators with them but if there are a few here and there that are having issues, uh, areas where it's not quite running fast enough, then going through and upgrading the, uh, the radiators to these ones, the, the more advanced ones, would be quite a nice way of just giving it a little bit of a boost. Speaking of sciences, he noticed that the one of the researchers that was running was struggling because we were short of matter science. And so, well, you can see that that's been kind of fixed now. This uh, belt looks very, very full to me. And that has been fixed by the rather simple method of just chucking some speed modules in everything. So we've got uh, tier, those tier six speed modules. Yes, there are speed module sixes in these uh, in the three machines that are actually producing the matter science. And then another beacon up here with, that's covering the entire um, matter science area with uh, with tier six beacon uh, speed modules to make everything run really, really quickly. Um, I see you couldn't put it underneath to get these ones as well because they're far too far away but that's going to be really that's going to be really nice it's going to make everything run nice and quickly here and as you can see that's been enough to produce all of the uh, the matter science that we could possibly need and uh, and sort that problem out lovely and as one final thing is for this video i shall leave you with this weird problem we've had down here in the uh, astro catalog area and the thermofluid has jammed because this tank has managed to fill up now that's not supposed to happen the idea is that we dribble a little bit of it through here as we need it and then that th and then that thermofluid just gets circulated throughout the whole system and it keeps ticking over nicely because we'll pump it out into here it'll get cooled down and then it'll get cooled down again and then maybe again and we'll ship it out as whatever temperature is needed and it'll come back as warm it'll go back into this tank and it'll go round and round the loop Unfortunately, Unfortunately, we seem to have got into a weird position where these tanks have managed to empty completely. We've got rid of all of our, we've got rid of all of our uh, supercooled and uh, cold thermofluid, and that has created in, enough in the system that we've now got this tank is completely full, and that means we can't produce the cooler tiers of thermofluid because when you when you supercool or when you hypercool thermofluid from cool to cold or cold to super chilled it also produces warm and because this pipe this because that means the, these pipes are full there isn't room for that warm to come out and therefore we can't pump any of the, the any of it further through now Tristan points out the easy way to fix this will be just come along to this pump here and say we don't want that to say 40k let's set that to 80k that will then slurp through some of the uh, cool thermofluid from here we can then start pumping the um pumping the warm back in from all the places where it's trying to come from that means these systems can start running again and because that will put extra load on here as well it'll carry on pulling it through from here and once these tanks fill back up again we can then i can then take this back down to potentially to back down to 40k if i want to or i can just leave that at 80k since it seems to not be uh, causing too much of an issue at that at that point but yeah that was a weird one because in theory it's a closed loop system it's been working perfectly for a long time. I've not needed to fiddle with it for ages. Maybe we've been using up the super chilled and the uh, and the cold faster than we have been before, and that's pulled it all through all the machines, and then created an overload up here in the in the tank at the top. I'm not sure, but we'll have to keep an eye on this. I suspect we may struggle to fill these two tanks back up again. Um, but yeah, I'll leave that running for a stream, and then look at it later and see and see whether the tanks have managed to fill back up again, and whether I need to think about putting even 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 more machines along here because there's, there's a lot of hypercoolers already. Uh, and they're all, oh, they're only on tier 2 speed modules, so perhaps I should upgrade this entire area to tier 3 speed modules, and that would sort sort it out. We'll, uh, I'll have to give that a try next time. So, yes, come along and join us on Thursday when we should be carrying on with this. I shall fix the thermofluid problems around here, I shall, and then I shall uh, fly out to a, a distant asteroid field and start thinking about Naquium and pounding my head against it, because it's going to be difficult. Uh, Tristan will carry on doing Tristan things. I'm not sure. Uh, probably uh, working on the Holmium and keeping the system ticking over around here. And I'm sure Mike will be work st still still be working on the Iridium because that seems to be an endless task for him. <laughs> I will also be back on Tuesday to continue the satisfactory stream, and there will be a uh, Factorio-related video coming out on Wednesday. Whether you're, uh, which video that is will depend on whether you're a supporter or not, because as always, I try to release the videos uh, a week early for supporters to say thank you for, you know, being a supporter. So, make sure, please make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss out on any of the stuff that's happening on the channel, and I shall see you next time. Bye-bye.